he'll tell us a little bit about his results from that survey work. And our third speaker is Jay Smith from Athabasca University in Alberta, Canada. He's an expert on transnational social movements and social justice, and he's going to talk about the North American origins and a degree of domestic political support for the Occupy movement, and place it into a, into a historical context. So we'll start off with Mark. Most notably in Melbourne in 2000, September 11, one year before the infamous 
um, 9-11, um, where there were tens of thousands of people protesting against, you know, the, the high flyers coming together um, to, to push, push their agenda. We also had mass mobilisations for May 1st for a couple of years, um, one of which was at the former corporate headquarters of the company that ran the detention centres for refugees, Australian Correctional Management, now at Serco, um, and another profiteering company um, making money off the misery of people being detained under our outrageous mandatory detention policy. In 2002, we had a mini ministerial meeting of the World Trade Organisation in Sydney, and there are a range of mobilisations that happened around that. Starting with one that I organised was a free movement of people um, march to contrast the fact that barriers are being put up to people movements around the world whilst multinationals can move wherever they like. Um, and also we, we went out to Homebush to protest against the actual meeting of the WTO. We had the Forbes, uh, Forbes 500, I think it is, uh, protest at the Opera House a couple of years later. However, the movement, that movement, both locally and globally, um, sort of stops happening. And I think we can contrast what's happened with the Occupy movement. You know, there were good things about that anti-globalisation movement in the early 2000s. Um, you know, that it brought people together, it linked issues. We, we started to have a systemic critique of what was happening. But they were very much focused around the summits of where the rich and powerful were meeting, where the G20 was meeting, where the WTO was meeting, sort of flashpoints that lasted for a couple of days in one particular location, and then it was over until the next sort of summit. Whereas what we've seen here is spontaneous you know, in, um, demonstrations. Of course they have local uh, permutation, local sort of uh, context to each and every Occupy demonstration, but Globally, we're all protesting around a similar sense of global injustice, global inequality, and the fact that the 1%, both globally and without, within all of our own countries, um, control a vast disproportionate amount of wealth and, and um, income. So on October the 15th, an, an amazing day, you know, over 80 countries, 950 odd cities taking place on the same day. And the fact that these things are sustained and not just focused on individual you know, um, confrontations with the 1% at their, at their talk fests, I think is something which is, you know, really inspiring. Um, moving right along to this year though, because as, as was said in the introduction, I think the global movement has taken inspiration from the revolutions that happened in Tunisia and Egypt, which spread to countries like Bahrain, which was heavily crushed, even to Saudi Arabia, there was attempts to have protests, but not only to the US puppets in the Middle East, but also the so-called anti-imperialist nations like Iran and Syria, there's been people's movements on the streets. And we've been told since, you know, the book Clash of Civilizations came out that, you know, we in the civilised democratic West um, would uh, counterpose to the sort of Arab masses incapable of forming democracy on their own part. They're only capable of democracy if we invade um, countries like Iraq and Afghanistan, yet they've, they've taught us a very strong lesson in what it means to stand up for, for more democracy. I mean, I was interviewed by the Australian a couple of weeks ago, and the angle they wanted to run was to try and discredit the, the sort of connection between uh, the, the movements in the West and the Arab Spring. And what I tried to say was, you know, what's obviously the local conditions are different. You know, we don't have a Mubarak, we don't have Ben Ali, we don't have Gaddafi. Um, however, in, in all situations, what we're fighting for is a, while they're fighting for any semblance of democracy, we're fighting for a deeper democracy rather than this sham thing that we have where we elect an alternate you know, government that still rules for the, for the 1%. Um, and in contrast, they just picked a couple of random students from Libya to say, you know, how dare they compare. But I think it's important for us to actually draw the connections and draw the fact that it is international. And Hagar was just telling me that apparently 20 people from Occupy Wall Street are going to Egypt for the elections to observe and participate in some of the rallies that are going to be happening. So it again reasserts that sort of global connection that we do have. It may be manifested differently in every nation, but it is a global, global movement. And obviously
obviously the, the movement that sprung up in Spain in, from May 15th, where squares were occupied across the nation, particularly in Madrid and Barcelona, but also in many other um, nations, was a major source of inspiration, I think, for us. Um, um, my, my partner um, went to Spain in June, July, and participated in some of the rallies, one of the rallies in her hometown, Saragossa, but also in Madrid, um, where on the 19th of June there were 300,000 people, not just meeting in Seoul, but in every suburb, every barrio of Madrid, there were marches started and then they'd march in together, converge, and just get bigger and bigger till they got to the middle. And I think that's something that we should aspire to. I know here at Sydney Uni there was a visiting uh, academic, visiting postgraduate student called Ramon, who I met while he was here, and he gave a talk here about the Indignados movement um, at Sydney Uni a few months ago. And, you know, over a beer with him, he was saying that they're going to very soon put a call out for October the 15th to be a global day of action. Three minutes? Okay. Um, so, you know, there were, there were attempts to try and start with this sort of Spanish community in Sydney. Um, you know, what we thought would be a modest, you know, protest in solidarity with the movement in Spain. But then, of course, Wall Street came onto the scene, other Facebook groups were set up, we contacted the organisers of the other Facebook groups, we came together, organising meetings, and on October 15th, we had 1,500 people. Eight days in Martin Place, you know, we were, we were evicted after eight days of inspiration, um, and that was obviously a blow to us, but in some ways it made us more mobile to get around, to do the sort of outreach stuff um, that we had to do, rather than always looking over our shoulders about when the clocks would eject us. And I think, you know, the, the slogan that Wall Street's taken up since they were thrown out, you know, overnight of you cannot evict an idea whose time has come is something which I think we were kind of saying when we were booted out of Martin Place and I think it's something that's highly relevant. Whether or not we have permanent occupation spaces, this idea is incredibly powerful, incredibly dynamic, incredibly determined movement and it's not going to go away in any sense. You know, we are, we are a diverse mob. We all come from, you know, different sort of political backgrounds. We've had different priorities in terms of what we've campaigned about in the past. I personally am a, a involved in a socialist organisation, involved in refugee campaigning. And, you know, there are sometimes some differences and some tensions about decision-making processes. Should we have absolute consensus? Should we strive for consensus? But if we can't reach it, have some kind of, you know, two-thirds or three-quarters majority to make our decisions. Um, however, we've surprising, despite some of those disagreements, I think we have achieved a lot in a very small space of time. And you know, if, if the movement isn't going to go away, we've got a number of events. There's some leaflets were handed out on the way in about both this Saturday and next Tuesday. And I'm sure we're going to be responding to the global call for another international day of action. I know it's been endorsed by London, I think Spain, and a few other places already for the 10th of December. Um, and the 17th of December is the anniversary of the guy in Tunisia who, who, who um, set himself on fire that triggered the whole thing. And then we've got the anniversary of Egypt next January and everything. So, you know, there's no sign at all that this movement is going to go away. And if, if there are people here who are new, who haven't been involved already, I can see a lot of familiar faces here, but also some unfamiliar faces, and come and talk to us about how you can get involved, how you can support the movement, and how we can broaden our support um, and our and our and our reach. So I'll oh, point Thanks. Thanks Mark. That was excellent timing. The one three minutes was scary. Okay, Peter. Oh. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm glad to be here. I guess um, what I'm talking about is from a more academic perspective and I'm just going to report really on the research that uh, Stuart Jackson and I did uh, on the 5th of September uh, about uh, looking at uh, the composition of the movement in Sydney uh, as an attempt to get a handle on 
um, in the, the, uh, the Occupy movement in Australia. Uh, the rationale behind this research was really motivated by uh, Jared Henderson of the Sydney Institute. Uh, Jared uh, is a great uh, writer. I'm sure you all read and enjoy his works uh, uh, greatly. And Jared Henderson had gone down and done some field work himself. He's, he's not just an uh, ivory tower academic uh, from a think tank. He went down and he, he found some people and basically he determined that the, uh, the Occupy movement was a bunch of sort of middle class twats who were uh, complaining because they'd never had it so good. And he featured a young woman who um, wanted really to work in an NGO for, uh, for scraps but could only satisfy herself with working in a top law firm uh, for hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. And uh, Jared's kind of perspective on this is uh, a refrain that we've heard many times uh, over the years that what are these people complaining about? Who are these protesters and why do they think they have any political legitimacy to speak for the majority? Um, I felt that possibly there was a methodological flaw or two um, in his approach. So what we did was we got together some wonderful volunteer researchers from the University of Sydney. We went down and we did 180 field interviews uh, with the people who turned out at that event. Now, because by this time Occupy Sydney had no longer been a, uh, an encampment, it had now become a mobile kind of uh, protest movement, uh, we did those interviews at the, the pre-part the pre of the rally, we marched with people, we talked to them as we marched, and overall we got this 180 field interviews constructed. And we got a sense of, in a sense, who um, are part of this movement. One of the things that we talk about when, we, when we're interested in uh, political social movements of this type is thinking about, in a sense, the theories that drive them along. There's a range of different kind of theoretical arguments that come out of the academy that say, you know, where do social movements come from? What's their, in a sense, life cycle? What drives them along? The current frame that a lot of the media discourse that we see in Australia tends to take is what's called the relative deprivation theory. It basically says is that social movements will arise when people are uh, suffering to some extent. Now, it may not be an absolute level of suffering, but they feel relatively um, deprived. But clearly, in the Australian situation, uh, we don't have the type of crippling economic crisis that we've seen uh, in Europe and North America to date. And so a lot of the media justification for being um, dismissive of the movement, it's received very little um, effective media coverage to date, or to ridicule the movement's uh, motives and, and propositions, has been that there is no relative dep deprivation that would justify this movement. We're also interested in cultural theories of social movements, and as we've seen, Mark has identified, in a sense, the way in which social movements, because they are movements of not just organisations but individuals, are able to become fallow at times when the political circumstances don't suit them, but this reactivate with skills and social networks and communication networks and repertoires of action and tactics and strategies very rapidly. And I think what we've seen in Australia is a classic example of a pre-existing movement that is reactivated very rapidly in response to what's seen as a political opportunity, the opportunity of international solidarity, but also concerns about inequality that are emerging into the popular discourse in Australia. Australia likes to tell lots of lies about itself as a nation, about our mateship and our easygoing character and our egalitarian society. And when we push these stories that we tell about ourselves, we often find that the basis is not as true as we'd like to think they are. And obviously a social movement like Occupy in Australia has a chance to reframe the popular discourse about who we are. And when you do that, you recreate the measures against which success out of the political system is determined. So if you're able to get issues like inequality, like corporate control, on the political radar, if they become a measure of political success in terms of machine politics, you can change the way in which politics works. So I think that's very important for this movement in Australia because when we went and looked at the um, Occupy movement and we, we analysed these 180 field interviews off a group of about, say, 600 participants, what's your estimate? For the Saturday, the 5th? The 5th? The 5th, I'd say 1,500. 1,500? We're saying 600. Please say 400. The AOB said 200. So, um, so a proportion of that population was that um, these people are not as they're characterised. They are not professional protesters. They're not 
you know, universally young students with dreadlocks who basically just like to get out, have a bit of a street protest, maybe occasionally have a little bus up with the police. It's all good fun and they can go back to their North Shore residences. The participants at the, uh, the Occupy rally themselves so are much older on average. They were on average uh, 39 years of old age. The youngest person we talked to was 14, the oldest was 63. 83. 83, sorry. Um, so they were spread across quite a, a broad range of people. Um, the vast majority of these people were in employment in some um, way. The unemployed people were represented and strongly represented for a protest movement of this sort. About 10% of the participants were unemployed and uh, about 10 or 12% were uh, retired people. So these weren't uh, necessarily uh, you know, rat bank students who were just looking to go to a protest. They're much older than that, more likely to be in employment in some way. When we looked at the party affiliation, we found some really interesting things. Um, unsurprisingly, for a group like Occupy, which expresses significant scepticism about the capacity of institutional politics, party politics, institutional legislative politics, to deliver the sort of social justice it's looking for, unsurprisingly, the majority of these participants were not aligned to any political party. So when asked whether they associate with a political party, over 40% of them identified they had no political party alignment. This is obviously a group of people who are very disenchanted with um, machine party politics in Australia, either through uh, a lifetime experience of that or through uh, a tradition of uh, anarchism. anarchism. Um, but interestingly, what we saw in this group, and this is going to place pressure on institutional politics to respond, was there was a small core of uh, union-based ALP affiliators, about 12%, and a large core of people who'd affiliate strongly with the Greens. And what we've seen recently, as uh, my co-researcher Stuart has identified, uh, recently the Greens in New South Wales has been having this discussion about how they respond to Occupy in Australia. Should they take on the cause of Occupy? Should they come out and support the movement? And the Greens in its current form, increasingly an electorally successful party, has been very cautious about being seen to take on this movement. But more than a third of the people at that rally there were Greens identifiers. So even if the party itself is unwilling to take on the Occupy banner and affiliate with Occupy in some way, they may have to recognise that their support base is out there. And the Greens' problem is, of course, as they see electoral success, they are encouraged to pull towards the centre of politics. That is undermining their support base to some degree. Um, the other major grouping were obviously people of socialist or communist uh, background, but they were the smaller kind of group. Overall, what we have here are a group of people who have very low regard for institutional politics, politicians, political parties, the political system, to deliver a political outcome. Unlike the average Australian, who is very cynical about politicians and journalists and professionals of all sorts, this group is also very sceptical about the capacity of the Australian democratic system to deliver real change. So if you ask the average Australian on the street, you say, well, what do you think of politicians? They say, well, I hate those scum, right? And then you say, well, what do you think of democracy? They say, well, democracy is great, Australian democracy is the best democracy in the world. The Occupy people in Australia are not like that. They both hate politicians and they do not see any solutions coming out of the existing democratic system. And this is where I think the media uh, has had trouble dealing with Occupy because of the political culture of Australia. Australia tends to have a political culture based on the political foundations of this nation as a colony, as a penal colony, as an institutionally oriented system where the government was very significant in the lives of most people throughout their life of expecting that politics resolves itself through institutional structures. And when media people ask Occupy participants, what policy do you want to see the government do? They don't understand the response. The response being, we're not really interested in the government to do any particular thing. We want the government to be aware of the concerns of the 99% and adjust their policies in response to that. This, I think, has more resonance in the United States, which has a more individualistic, sceptical political culture with regards to government service delivery. And this is why I think you will find, if you go to, as my partner did recently, Occupy Philadelphia, Lyndon LaRouchian sitting next to hardcore Marxists, sitting next to anarchists and the like, a very kind of much more diverse group of people that come from both the left, as we've seen in Australia, but also what you might call part of the right political spectrum in that country. What the Occupy people in Australia are not is cynical. If we're concerned about 
uh, Flavoy Zizek's political, you know, uh, ideology of cynicism, the Occupy people do not fit in that category. So one of the questions we asked of the group was, do you think Occupy will create real political change? And the group, by and large, universally believed that Occupy would be successful. So this isn't a group of people who are out just to protest because protesting is cool and fun and a police dust-up is a good way to spend the weekend. These are a group of people who think their bottom-up action is going to affect change. Now, I think obviously one of the difficulties that Occupy will have is can they sustain that over the medium term? The small size of the movement to date means that a uh, strong core are part of uh, you know, a vanguard kind of organising group. So about 25% of the people we talked to at that event were actually connected to some of the organisers in some way. So the movement has yet to move away from the core, who are going to be much more committed over the long haul than the general populace. Whereas in the United States, in Europe, you're seeing much more mobilisation into the general community. And so when that core group of organisers reduces down to a couple of percentage number of the, the group of people who are at those events, then we'll see that the Occupy movement has really caught fire in Australia, and that's yet to occur. Um, finally, I think, and, and this will be the final point, am I going okay? Um, is that what we can also say is there is a shift, I think, from the late 90s, early noughties. Uh, Self-confessed, I worked for the police in 2000, and I had a very good view of uh, the 9-11 the protests in Melbourne. Uh, through uh, through uh, telephoto lenses in the police building, um, and but I think what we saw there was very much the expectations of protest. Here was a group of people with power. We will gather around them and express our concerns, and they should go and make decisions. Okay. Whereas I think today the diffused nature of the Occupy movement, its unwillingness to make very specific political claims and concerns means that the citizenship being expressed is different. There is much more, I think, a sense of this monitory citizenship, where citizens say, I recognise that all these institutions that we once trusted to deliver outcomes on our behalf are not as trustworthy as we think. And we are going to monitor them and speak out using a variety of media, a variety of platforms, a variety of tactics to draw them back in line. We are not going to become part of these institutions but we are going to surveil these institutions. And I think it's very interesting the comment that Ariadne made. Everyone's pointing cameras at everyone else in this current political milieu. Thank you.
And once it disappears, it will be like the, the sagebrush which blows away with the wind. And I would like to say, if you put it in a larger context, uh, that's absolutely not true. So, in terms of my research, I should refer to is that I've been studying these movements for 12 years. Some of you may remember the multilateral agreement of investment, which was being negotiated in, in Paris in 1998. I texted that, got on the web, there was a huge uproar, eventually that was defeated. I've conducted research on the Battle of Seattle, the World Trade Organization in, in the 90s. And more recently, I've been focusing on the World Social Forum. Uh, it's various events and, and processes in terms of re research, in terms, and also as well, organizing a local social forums where I live in, in Edmonton, Alberta. Now, the, this movement of which I would situate the Occupy movement is really a reaction to, I think what we all know, or most of you do know, is neoliberal, neoliberal globalization, which means, or some describe more simply as market fundamentalism which puts an emphasis above, on the market above all else in society, the disembedding of the market from all other social responsibilities. A market dominated by large corporations, you often say Australian, uh, excuse me, the American, European, Japanese, but Australia plays the same game as well in terms of its corporations, particularly in terms of its mining corporations. Now, neoliberalism stresses as well the liberalization of trade, the privatization of significant sectors of the public sector and the financialization of capital and the spread of this ideology and economy on a global scale. Now the global justice movement, which I describe a bit later, uh, is really the embodiment of more recent movements against neoliberal, neoliberal globalization for the last 30 years. Now, the global justice movement if I can use some academic jargon here, it's really those loose networks of organizations and actors who engage in collective action of various kinds on the basis of the shared goal of advancing the cause of justice, economic, social, political, and environmental among and between peoples across the globe. Now, first I'd like just to move back and put the Occupy movement the global justice movement, which really appeared when neoliberal globalization first reared its head in, in the 70s and 80s, and look at it in, in a longer context. And here I'd like to draw upon the work of a great political economist, some of you might have heard of him, Carl Polanyi, 1886 to 1964. In his most famous work, The Great Transformation, uh, Carl Polanyi, 1944, use the expression, the double movement, to analyze the growth and expansion of capitalism in the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. For Polanyi, the double movement was key to understanding the history of capitalist advance. The 18th and 19th century, Great Transformation, led to the expansion of the free market, or the market as an attempt to disembed, to free the market from all social and political Restraint. At the same time, a counter movement occurred. In the 18th century and even earlier, rich landowners, with the cooperation of the state, appropriated public lands for private benefit. Well, we still hear the resonance from that story today. Thus, the great loss of the commons. And we have a sense today, in a different way, of the loss of the commons. Resistance by the dispossessed peasantry was strong and fierce. Later, during the Industrial Revolution, harsh and exploitative working conditions led to another counter movement. This counter movement emphasized the need for social protection and ultimately led to the creation of the welfare state. So, if you look around where you're at today, any public services, that you may have didn't come to you by a process of virgin birth. They came as a process of struggle, of people who were reacting to the excesses and exploitation of a particular economic system. And at this time, as it did in the period of the dispossession of the peasants from the commons, there was an attempt to disembed, separate the market, the economy from all other aspects of, of uh, of the economy and 
impact and social responsibility. So, in a way, the, the counter movement is, a, is an attempt to put social and democratic control over the market and capitalism. So, I put emphasis on this discussion because I think there's an emphasis on the Occupy movement as something that's here and now. But I think it's just been one part of a series of counter movements to the excesses of, of a capitalist system. Now, just turning to more recent, and more, more recent, I can put it in the perspective of the last 30 years, that resistance to match the scale of economic activity has moved up from the state to a global level as the nature of economic activity has moved up uh, there as well. Now, the precursors of movements we see today in the Occupy movement uh, is a fundamental part of forming the global justice movement. Uh, can be found in what occurred in the 70s and 80s in the global south. In the 70s and 80s, financial institutions from the north, uh, the World Bank, the International Monetary uh, Fund, came knocking and said, we have all this money, we'd like to lend it to you, we have great projects you might want to uh, engage in. And, and many countries in the global south took them up on that offer. But what happened? Commodity prices went down, they couldn't pay back their debts. What happened? Well, austerity programs were imposed upon these countries. Uh, they had a loss of democracy. The people themselves were made through the countries had to repay these debts. So this is a precursor of what you see in Greece today. You start with the global south, it spread to Greece. Each time those not affected said, well, these people can't run their lives, they can't organize themselves. But you can see the nature of the change of the concentric circle. First, the global south, then Southern Europe, but then there's something in the center. The tide is moving inwards, in other words. So, uh, following the reaction to this, I should say, was a series of IMF riots. So, again, these occurred in the global south. There wasn't that much coverage. But there was a strong reaction, counter-movement to what was occurring. And there are a series of markers I just want to briefly refer to in terms of the formation, I think, and the creation of political the creation of the culture of the current Occupy movement. And the first is that of uh, the Zapatista uprising in 1994. The Zapatista uprising occurred on the, upon the signing of the North American Free Trade Agreement. The Zapatistas feared, and these were the Indians of Chiapas in southern Mexico, that with the signing of this Free Trade Agreement, that subsidized, heavily subsidized, U.S. corn, inferior corn, Yellow corn would saturate the Mexican market and they would drive out their good white corn and many of them would be dispossessed. In fact, this to a large extent has come true. The, the American uh, subsidization of corn really had made it such that the Mexicans cannot compete. And with the the, uh, Chavis, the, uh, the Zapatistas had a foreboding in England that this was going to occur. So there was a, a counter movement, you might say, by the Zapatistas. And from the Zapatistas have come, I think, a, a culture that has been very formative on many other movements. And just, there's a, a saying, an adage of the Zapatistas, one no, many yeses. Meaning, in fact, there's not a single answer to the alternative of economic globalization. That, as some Commandante Marco said, we could have one world with room for many worlds. That is, in, to, to replace the homogeneity of the market and neoliberalism, we didn't need the homogeneity of another system. We were entitled to pursue a different paths. And Zapatistas put an emphasis on the notion of encuentros, meetings, where these issues would be debated. And in here you see the seeds of the culture that's given for uh, birth to the Occupy movement and its emphasis on the General Assemblies. And then in Seattle, a very, a very important marker, you have the Battle of Seattle, where tens of thousands of workers, environmentalists, and teachers met to protest the activity of the World Trade Organization, which had as an institution of global governance responsibility for implementation of the neoliberal 
agenda. And what occurred in Seattle uh, was a mass, there were massive protests for which the police were not prepared. There was an overreaction. Uh, there was considerable chaos on the, in the streets. Thousands of, many people were arrested, uh, but only two people were formally charged and convicted, and those were the police. And it's been mentioned today about the role of the police, and I think this is very important in these movements, because there, there's a darker side to it. These movements are followed and tracked by the police. Uh, but there was another police riot in Genoa in 2002, which was condemned across the, through the parliaments of Europe. And when you look at the activities of the police, in most of these instances, these movements have been counterproductive. Uh, they have had unintended consequences. So I think this is very important to remember just in terms of the activities of the police. They don't always end on the terms of the police. No, Seattle was just about, was not about protest. It was about discussion, about people together, having meetings, making connections across the world. Australians were there and present. And, and I think as uh, Mark referred to, he referred to a series of other uh, new liberal summits in uh, Prague, Quebec City, Genoa, Barcelona. But each time what occurred were that, that people in protest were going to someone else's venue. And what happened in, in 2001 was a creation by the global justice movement, broadly speaking, of the world's social forum. It was a creation and invention of political space in Porto Alegre, Brazil. Uh, the basic purpose of the world's social forum is an open meeting space for reflective thinking, democratic debate of ideas, formulation of principles uh, that are opposed to neoliberalization and dominization of the world by capital in any form. Now, the, the world's social forum has taken place in a number of countries up to 155,000 people attend. Now, one of the things that have come out of it, one of the alternatives that have come out of it, is something called a, a Toba tax, a, a tax on financial transactions. Just put a little small tax on financial transactions of all that money sloshing across the world, and have that flow into public hands and replenish and, and renovate the public and the public institutions and public services. It's interesting that two weeks ago the Vatican endorsed the idea of, of a Toba tax, financial transaction tax, which the Occupy movement has, I think, skillfully rebranded as a Robin Hood tax. So, to sum up what these have, movements have contributed to was a particular culture of, uh, of protests and of, of, of these movements. It's a, a culture with its emphasis on horizontality, on on lateral, on being lateral, on the grassroots, or, or on uh, popular participation. So it's composed of networks that are decentralized, loosely knit, flat, open, nine hierarchical, democratic. Well, this is very much the soil from which the Occupy movement has come. Now, if you want to look at more uh, specific inspirations, and I think Mark was talking about inspirations, and they're very inspirational. The, the Arab Spring and also the Indignados movement in Spain. But when you look at the core, the values of the movement, they are very similar, uh, very much the same or similar to the, 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 the culture that has, has, has arisen in the global justice movement over the last 30 years. And I should say, as a fundamental value in this regard, is uh, nonviolence. An opposition to violence, an evaluate, evaluation of uh, evaluation of a radical form of democracy and and diversity. So uh, there are attempts to shut the Occupy movement down. I understand there was a movement in like 17 of them were, were uh, evacuated or moved out of the states. I understand that uh, just occurred the last last day. Now. This may be seen as a real blow against the Occupy movement, but on the other hand, and we discussed this with Mark earlier today, it may be a blessing for the Occupy movement because there was a real fundamental choice. Are you going to stay there and stay there forever, or are you going to do something different? Well, in a way, the choice has been made. So that the Occupy movement 
may have more freedom and flexibility to move on and recreate itself in other ways. But I think what is really fundamental is, is to realize that the, the causes of the Occupy movement are not going to go away. I think they'll, they'll become part of, a, of the larger counter movement that is arising. And this is arising in the United States, I must say, against the 1%. And I think the 1% versus 90%, 99% is a very, very good, uh, if not brilliant, framing. If you look at public opinion polls in the, in the United States, about 55 to 58% of the middle class have favorable views of the Occupy movement. The same is true of the working class. And I just had a poll last week that came from Canada. The numbers are much the same. Uh, but for youth, the, the figures are quite startling. It's 73% of youth in Canada support the Occupy movement. And I don't think you have to have, uh, be a genius to, to answer that question of why. Because more than ever, youth today are seeing many doors at the doors to the future being closed. They certainly see that in Southern Europe. Uh, it's happening in Canada as well. There's a much greater struggle for youth in terms of uh, being able to get a good job, a decent job, a well-paying job with pensions. Uh, many of these jobs, you might say, are part of the world of precarious work. And I think uh, it, it takes no uh, great pondering to understand why youth, more than any other part of the population, would be supportive of the Occupy movement. If, if, if I might, I'd just like to uh, end with a, a couple of quotes. The first comes from Mayor Jean Gerald, Gerard Tremblay, the Mayor of Montreal, speaking just a few days ago on this Canadian broadcast system about the Occupy movement. He says the following, Montreal has always been a different city. Like other major cities, we have poverty, we have homeless people, which we didn't used to have not long ago. And we have a lot of citizens that are fed up with the status quo. And we are saying, they are saying very clearly, it is possible to change things. We are willing to spend time to show the world that we care. The leaders of states in 1948 signed a Declaration of Human Rights. Everybody wants equality and liberty, which are two of the values in that important charter. But they forgot there is another value, which is fraternity. Or if you prefer brotherhood and sisterhood or solidarity. That is what is being expressed today. We're fortunate to have some young people, people, we're fortunate to have some people that are here in Montreal who are saying loud and clear what a lot of people think individually. So long as the place is secure, that we have peace, public peace for me, we're going to moderate every day, every hour. We'll give an opportunity for people that want to express their frustrations to do it. I think Montreal needs to show the world that we have 120 communities of different origin and we can live in peace. It's because we have two fundamental values. Uh, the first is human dignity and the second is social justice. And I'd like to have end with a quote from Gandhi. Uh, Peter used the word ridicule. And we've heard this quite often. So I think uh, Gandhi is an appropriate way to end. And he said the following, first they ignore you, then they ridicule you, ridicule you then they fight you, and then you win.
Um, along with that, we've had like a lot of other big events. Um, last weekend on Saturday, we had a free school in Hyde Park where um, there were six different workshops held and almost 100 people attended. Um, tomorrow, we start attending court for people's court dates. Like, there's a whole lot of events going on. So I think the idea that it's short-lived, um, like yesterday was a month-long anniversary. So this is definitely a misconception. Um, the second one, this is to do with the survey. My next question is to do with the survey. Um, in the survey, and I did it uh, with someone, and you use the word organizers. And in my view, and a lot of other people I think at Occupy, like the use of the term organizers doesn't really describe what people do or, what, or how people see themselves. And I said this to the person when they were taking the survey, and they said to me that quite a few other people had echoed this view and said that they don't see themselves as organizers, they see themselves as participants. We've talked about some general assemblies in, between each other, and the only way I think we'd use the word organizers is to say everyone's organizer. Like, Anyone who turned up that set and anyone who turns up at all is, is an organiser of Occupy Sydney. I think that's a reflection of like, our collective decision making process where we use consensus so everyone does have an equal stake in the process. So my first question is about whether the academic discourse around social movements has the language or the frameworks to understand what Occupy is doing. Seeing as like in the same way as the media, like um, some of the research is coming out, some of the comments from academics. So I think quite misrepresented what the structures and what Occupy is actually about, um, specifically in Sydney, but also internationally. Um, my second question is about the demographic results. And I was really surprised by a lot of things you said, like um, partly about the age thing, but mostly about the large presence of Greens and ALP members, um, which I personally haven't experienced when I've been speaking to a lot of people at Occupy over my involvement there. And I think this is distortion maybe in the demographics. It's probably because of the day and the event that the survey was taken at. Like, and I think if you've taken a survey or like done a survey at 2 a.m. perhaps the next morning when we were, like, when we were at Hyde Park doing the police, or if you've done a survey at free school or, or at any of the general assemblies that continue to happen three times a week, then you get a very different um, view of like who's in Occupy and what um, and those demographic results. So my second question is, are you going to do more research to perhaps um, correct that distortion or continue to like learn more about Occupy like, as it continues to evolve, will there be more research and will they be done at a range of different events and not just at those sort of rallies? Okay. Hey. Yeah, okay, that's good. Um, well, I guess there's four points I'd, I'd probably address there and I don't disagree necessarily with them. The first is, yeah, I mean, short-lived is not the term. I mean, there have been uh, encampments that have been short-lived and climate have broken up. I don't think that's necessarily problematic and I haven't implied that the movement's been broken up. I think actually the repertoire switching from encampments to building occupations is a, a better one because, in a sense, one of the difficulties that Occupy in Australia has is talking about inequality. Now, when I first, the very first time, it's uh, obviously a video sometimes. Like that. Switching, we have a literature on that. I think the interesting things are 
in a sense, the media use stuff, the notion of citizenship, we're talking about these. But you guys behave and we'll look at it and if there's something new under the sun, we'll respond with a new theory. That's usually the way it works. Except for Jay, who's obviously an activist, so he'll come up with a new theory and then you guys will pick it up. <laughs> in, terms of, in terms of the distortion, obviously I think there's a difference between the core group and all the people at that event. We certainly know through that faulty question of are you part of an organising group, possibly we can, we can cite that out and certainly, yeah, we think that some of those people will disappear. ALP members were only about 12% though. The biggest group were people who didn't identify with any political party at all, that's over 40%. The second were Greens. Um, and this is not members, obviously this is identifiers. The vast majority of people in Australia, unlike in the United States and Canada, are not members of political parties to begin with. So those questions are very difficult. But for hit and run research, I think we did okay. Um, <laughs> but we're definitely going to write all of these comments into our research limitations. I'd just like to add one comment if I may. Uh, there is a generation of scholars, younger scholars, who are very much participants in, in the movement. I mean, serious committed. Uh, I know many of them. They're engaged. And so there's a sense of perspective uh, from the inside, ethnographic research, participant observation. It's not a perfect answer, but it, it, it is, I think, a very good complement for, for research that is survey research, which is very valuable. But I think you also have to have the perspective of those who are engaged in part of it of it as well, and being critical uh, as well. So I think that's one other way that you can perhaps cross that bridge into a different perspective on the movement.
he went from token tax to regulation to nationalise the banks, basically. Um, you know, how, how do we make those links um, effectively, organically, and still keep drawing people in? And I think there are a lot of strengths in the culture of it that actually overcome some of the bad things that happen on the left and in, in the labour movement. So it's how to mesh new things together to make a new um, class conscious movement. I, I think it has to become class conscious against capital to really make inroads into power. Well, I'll, I'll just try it briefly, and then I think Mark has something to add. I'm sure, sure. Uh, well, I think the movement will keep on moving, if I can put it that way. And that's because there are going to be so many opportunities uh, at hand. Basically, the system is, right now, is in a crisis of tremendous instability. And this will be an opportunity as the system becomes more unstable and it becomes more dangerous that it will be very hard to ignore. I mean, you hear Australia is faring a bit different than other uh, parts of the world. Uh, my, analogy, my analogy here would be that uh, the global economy is, is integrated and Australians are simply saying that the other end of the boat is sinking. And the other end of the boat is sinking. My end boat's dry, yours is sinking. And uh, the water it will, will lap up, and invariably people will know, they'll see it. And this is actually starting to occur in the United States. And I don't think the discourse, and, and I, don't, I won't go as far as you in saying we have to have the framing in a particular uh, perspective. I think it's more important to get people out, united, and acting. And they can walk under any flag that they want, but as long as, again, uh, Marcos, one no. I think you have to say fundamentally no, and we'll argue about the yeses later. Uh, but in the United States, one, and I didn't mention this, but one of the achievements of the Occupy movement is realization of just how unequal the United States has become. And I just have some, just the stats here. In 2001, the CEOs of the, of the largest American companies, on average, have earned 531 times as the average worker up from 1980 when that was only 42 times greater. That almost all the wealth creation of the last three years has accrued into, into very, very few hands. The 1%, that's accurate. And there's now a, an awareness in the United States of that. The channel has changed from tax cuts to, to an awareness that the system is game, that it's unequal, that something has to be done. And some positive things occur just by watching the watch, watch, watch. In the uh, United States, I was talking about and two weeks ago, workers in the state of Ohio, many other social movements, got together to defeat a, a, a very harsh piece of legislation which stripped workers of uh, the right to organize. That legislation was defeated in a referendum uh, by 63% of the people in Ohio by a huge margin. And state after state after state where the conservative right wing had overreached, whether it regard to women, whether it regard to vote, whether for, for gays and for lesbians, for a host of other uh, targets of the right, all their harsh measures were defeated. And so that's something. That's a very important statement. But the other part of this, and I'll just end here, is there's a realization you have to connect these movements to political institutions. You always, in the end, have to connect your movement to some, to some set of order or political institutions in terms of decision making. So I see what's occurring in the United States as, as hopeful that we might be having a change in direction in terms of public discourse. And I think that is really, really important.
in a space, I think, like that first General Assembly where, you know, to have a thousand people sitting there talking about, you know, just, you know, generally what is going on in the world, how is it that there's so much scarcity amidst, amidst so much abundance, why is the world, you know, um, you know more unequal than it ever has been before, like, why is this sort of inequality in Australia? And, and really drawing inspiration, I think, from, from the, yeah, the change, it, from the, the movements in the Arab world and, and in Europe about that actually we can, we can come together and we can, we can say something about this. And that was, that was so inspirational. I think I was really captured in the first night where, you know, a good few hundred people, like, stood up, you know, stood up to the police and said, actually, we're going to stay here, we're going to stay up, stand our ground, we're, we're going to make our point, we're going to make sure that it's heard. Um, but I do think that this is a, um, yeah, a really fantastic discussion and, and like an opportunity to have a discussion about where to for the, you know, for the movement now. Because I do think it is, it is facing, I think, some 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 difficult questions. Um, I think I think it is true that, um, and it's important to acknowledge that the situation in Australia is different to, to where the movements have have, have sprung up in a, in a massive way. You know, there's not the 45% youth unemployment that there is in Spain that are going to see. You know, um, many, many youth like flooding into the squares and making it a really, really strong occupation. But I also think in saying that that like it's important to realize I think that there are some like there are some things that we can still do in Australia that we can that we can still like I think capture the enormous sentiment. The fact that the second rally was actually bigger than the first, I was surprised at, and I, I think we can actually draw confidence from like that there is still you know potential to to engage with, with political issues around Australia, but. I, I guess I, I sort of agree with what, what the last speaker over here said, that I think it's very important to, to not see like the square, like the occupation, um, yeah, in and of itself as the answer, but rather the occupation as part of, of, of what we are doing, like, and connecting the, the radicalism, I think, of, of the occupation that exists in Martin Place with, with the struggles that are actually people are involved in in Australia, whether it's whether it's the struggle of, um, you know, public sector workers at the moment against um, Barry and Barrow, whether it's the struggle against the scapegoating of refugees, the struggle for action on climate change. We want, you know, the radicalism and, and, and Occupy, I think, to connect them and to, yeah, to, to push them and, and pull, pull them forward. And that, I think, will be the, the real strength. And so I guess I sort of um, disagree a little bit, Emma, I think, with what you were saying towards the end. Like, I don't think what we want to do is there's the hardcore of Occupy and then there's the Labour and the Green supporters over here. Like, I actually think... Like the Labour and Green supporters, they are part of the 99%. They, you know, have an interest in connecting with us and connecting with what we're doing in, in, in the square. And so I think that, yeah, we want to, we want to, we want to continue to use that radicalism, but absolutely like connect it with the with the day-to-day -day struggles that, that people are facing at the moment in Australia. Thank you. That's a comment because I want to say in a non patronising tone. <laughs>
the, the police have a response that we saw first in Melbourne and in Sydney um, is not going to be effective, I think. Um, it won't be the police that's correct this in Australia. Yeah. Yeah. Um, laptop? Yeah, that's right. I've got a question about um, the, the potential longevity and, and general support of the Occupy movement here in Sydney and in Australia in general. Um, I have a friend who's a law student, an Indigenous law student in Sydney, and she took issue with the name Occupy Sydney because she she said that Sydney's been occupied for more than 200 years. Um, and I mean, I, I've been reading a bit about um, something called the, the de decolonial t uh, term in Latin America, which basically says that all of the state and corporate power structures in the modern world are inherently and inex inextricably tied to colonialism. And that's certainly the case in Australia. And I'm wondering if the um, support for the Occupy Sydney or Melbourne or whatever uh, uh, movement in Australia might be stymied a little bit by the general lack of comfort, I think, that the um, socially aware segment of the Australian population feel uh, by the fact that they kind of also are, their entire existence in this country is predicated, predicated on old colonial structures. So I'm wondering how much of a problem that might be. I mean, to paraphrase Bill Hicks, it's the, the, the message generally is go back to split, sleep Australia where free to do as we tell you, uh, you're free to do as we tell you. And I'm wondering if that's going to be a problem in analyzing support, that sense of post-colonial guilt.
Yeah, that's a brilliant problem. <laughs>
Chomsky said in his address to the Occupy group in Boston, uh, make sure you grow naturally before you try to take the system on. And uh, the question is, do we, what is the best way of doing that? One thing I think is really striking is that on the 30th of September, the New York group put forward a lot of claims. I think there were about two dozen claims charging the corporations, which is sort of a shortcut for capitalism because the general public understands corporations, they go off and they're frightened of the word capitalism. You know, you have uh, bankrupted our students with, you know, mega, mega fees, you have foreclosed on our homes, you have etc, etc, etc. And this very fine list of a lot of claims, or charges really, I, I felt could be used on the media, it could be used on flyers to give out next time there's a demonstration. You could even have an advertisement, a big page in the Herald setting this out so that people really know how broad and sensible the agenda is. So I don't know what people think about that. I'm going to take final. I'll take that as a statement. Ha, ha, ha.